On behalf of the faculty and staff and students of the school and of the University of Wisconsin, I want to welcome all of you to the seventh annual Charlotte Zolotow Lecture. This lecture series has been endowed in honor of Charlotte Zolotow, an alumna of this university. Ms. Zolotow studied English with Helen C. White, the legendary chair of the English department for whom the building across the street is named. Appropriately, appropriately enough, that building is now the home of the Cooperative Children's Book Center. When Charlotte Zolotow studied here, some members of the faculty believed that children's books could not be literature. Fine literature, after all, has multiple layers. It has characters who do things for complex reasons. The story plays out against a rich and nuanced background. The tension and drama often arise from profound questions about the human condition that have resonated within a culture for centuries. Even today, we would concede that it's not easy to create literature with those qualities for an audience of children. Despite the doubts, Charlotte Zolotow went on from here to become a distinguished editor and author of children's literature, including more than 65 picture books of her own. Ms. Zolotow is not able to be with us in person tonight, but she will be joining uh, us from her home in New York City via the webcast. So welcome, Charlotte Zolotow. We at the School of Education are proud to be the home of the Cooperative Children's Book Center in partnership with the Wisconsin Department of Education, of Public Instruction, sorry. Formally, the CCBC is a non-circulating reference collection of children's books, both current and historical. However, the hardworking staff of the, C of the CCBC have made it much more than that. It is an extraordinary resource a gold mine of good information for parents, teachers, librarians, and scholars. The CCBC promotes the understanding and appreciation of children's literature. It also endeavors to pass on to young readers the intellectual freedom that we Americans claim as a birthright. More than any other single individual, it has been Virginia Moore Cruz who has built the CCBC to its present stature. Ginny retired two years ago after serving as director for 26 years. She's with us tonight. Please stand, Ginny, so that we can recognize you. Tonight, We'll be hearing from a writer whose stories transport young readers to unfamiliar settings. A single shard set in 12th century Korea is about Celadon pottery so exquisite that its quality can be appreciated even in a fragment. It's about much more than that, of course. That's what gives it the richness and complexity that distinguish fine literature. Even the language of the book reminds me of fine china. One of Tree Ear's recurrent dreams is to create a vase. And let me quote from the book. It would be a prunus vase, the most elegant of all the shapes, tall and beautifully proportioned, rising from its base to flare gracefully and then round to the mouth. A prunus vase was designed for one purpose, to display a single branch of flowering plum. Now to me, a passage like that is like a shard of Potter Min's Celadon, so elegant that we can infer the quality of the book from a single paragraph. For those of us in education, children's literature at this level reminds us yet again that real reading, the kind that engages children for life, cannot be assessed by the tests 
that carry such high stakes for children and for schools today. The tests give us useful, but ultimately superficial information. With great respect to our test makers, we have not yet learned how to measure the excitement of discovering a whole new world. Just as we are fortunate to have Ginny Moore Cruz's leadership of the CCBC, we are equally fortunate in her successor, Kathleen T. Horning. Katie and her colleagues, Megan Schliesman, Mary Lindgren, and Hollis Rudiger, are not only carrying on, but continuing to improve the full range of CCBC services. They are deeply committed people, and they are expert librarians who are advancing the CCBC's distinguished record and its vital agenda. It is now my pleasure to introduce Katie Horning, Director of the Cooperative Children's Book Center. Katie. I'm uh, pleased to welcome you here to the seventh annual Charlotte Zolotow Lecture and to introduce this evening's distinguished speaker, Linda Sue Park. Um, we're pleased that this year the Zolotow Lecture is one of the opening events of the uh, Wisconsin Book Festival. I want to tell you a little bit about Linda Sue um, before she comes out to speak. Um, Linda Sue was born not too far from here in Urbana, Illinois, and she grew up in Park Forest, a suburb of Chicago. She was an avid reader as a child. In her Newberry acceptance speech a few years ago, she remembered the times her father took her to the library and encouraged her to read. She is still an avid reader. A visit to her official website will lead you to lists of her favorite books, several lists, in fact, including Recent Reading, My Most Memorable Books, Childhood Favorites, Favorites Now, Fantasy and Authorship, Historical Favorites, and her top 10 favorite children's books, <laughs> which actually has 11 titles on it. Her enthusiasm for reading, both then and now, is obvious. She was an avid writer as a child as well. She had her first work published in Trailblazer magazine when she was just nine years old. It was a haiku. In the green forest, a sparkling bright blue pond hides and animals drink. For that, she was paid $1. Her first book for children was published in 1999, and like all of her novels to date, Seesaw Girl was a work of historical fiction set in Korea. It was followed by The Kite Fighters, the story of two brothers, one skilled at making kites, the other skilled at flying them. And her third book, A Single Shard, won the Newbery Medal for the most distinguished contribution to literature for children in the United States um, in 2002. Set in 12th century Korea, a single shard features as its protagonist um, a young orphan named Tree Ear who develops a fascination with pottery making, especially that made by the master potter in his town, a cantankerous man called Min. Her most recent novel, When My Name Was Kyoko, was something of a departure. Although it, too, is a historical novel set in Korea, it is told from alternating points of view, that of a brother and that of a sister growing up in Japanese-occupied Korea during World War II. This year, Linda Su had um, two picture books published as well, The Firekeeper's Son, a story set in early 19th century Korea, and Mung Mung, a playful book of multilingual animal sounds. She has three more picture books in the works for 2005, including a follow-up to Mung Mung, which will be a multilingual book of people sounds called Yum 
yuck. <laughs> In all of her books, Linda Sue Park shows her considerable skill at transporting readers far away, both in terms of time and place, and yet holding up a mirror for young readers so that they can see some commonalities and universal truths. She is here tonight to talk to us about her work, both as a writer and a reader. Please join me in welcoming Linda Sue Park. Hello. I can hardly believe I'm standing up here now giving a lecture named in honor of Charlotte Zolotow. Charlotte Zolotow's work meant so much to me when I was a child that I cannot imagine any other writer in whose honor I would rather be speaking. The year is 1964. The place, Park Forest, Illinois, a south suburb of Chicago. I am four years old, and I live there with my parents and my three-year-old brother. In another year, a baby sister will join the family. Even though we have not lived in Park Forest very long, my father has already established a weekend routine for the family. On Sunday mornings, we go to church. On Saturday mornings, we go to the library. My dad chooses books for me and my brother using articles from magazines and newspapers, reference books, and above all, the recommended book lists that he gets from the librarians. And young as I am, I'm allowed to choose books for myself as well. But my dad doesn't want me to go wandering around out of sight, so while he peruses the shelves, he tells me to sit right there and don't go anywhere. Right there is a table with an attached bench, sort of like a cafeteria table. It's in the middle of the children's section, so my dad can see me from wherever he happens to be. And as fate would have it, the nearest shelf to the table holds the books by authors with the last names W through Z. <laughs> and the books that I can reach without leaving my seat are the Z books. <laughs> the little bubble of space created by that table and that shelf becomes my special place every week. And the books there are the ones I bring home week after week. There is Harry the Dirty Dog by Jean Zion. A year or two later, I will find Mommy Buy Me a China Doll by Harv and Margot Zemeck, which I will read to my baby sister so often that we can both recite the whole text to this day. But most important of all, the Z shelf holds the most wonderful books by an author with the magical name Charlotte Zolotow. Among my favorites were her books over and over, Mr. Rabbit and the Lovely Present, do You Know What I'll Do?, and Big Brother. Echoes of those books have haunted me all my life. All through my childhood and well into my teen years, I wished ardently that I were a redhead. Not because of Pippi Longstocking, although that might be a good guess, but because of the little girl in Over and Over, whom illustrator Garth Williams portrayed with a beautiful head of flaming red hair. When I was an adult, my family received one of those Harry and David gift baskets for a holiday present, and I was delighted because it looked very much like the basket put together by the little girl in the rabbit in Mr. Rabbit and the Lovely Present. But besides those kinds of small, delightful echoes, one of Ms. Zolotow's books was to have an enormous impact on both my life and my work. When my daughter was born in 1989, she was nameless for 10 days because my husband and I couldn't agree on a name. He wanted Corina after the Bob Dylan song. I argued in favor of Anna. My husband finally gave in after he rem I reminded him that he had already gotten his choice when our son had been born four years earlier. But why Anna, he asked, and I didn't know why. I thought vaguely that it might be sort of to honor my sister, whose name is Julie Ann, and I told him that I thought it was a classic, timeless name in several cultures. But neither of those was the real reason. It wasn't until several years later that I realized the real reason. I was hunting up old books, both literally and in my mind, books that I had loved as a child that I wanted my children to read. 
And then it hit me like a lightning bolt. One of my very favorite childhood books was a story called The Man with the Purple Eyes by Charlotte Zelotow. I had probably read it two or three hundred times. And in that story, the little girl's name is Anna. The instant I remembered that, I knew it was the reason I had chosen to name my daughter Anna. I found out that the book was out of print and I could not locate a copy. So I wrote to Charlotte Zalatow and told her that story and she sent me a signed copy of the book. I was indeed a rereader as a child, and I still am today. That seems to be another of those either or characteristics. My husband reads a lot, but he cannot understand the rereading impulse. He feels that he will never be able to read everything he wants to read as, he, as it is. So why would he spend valuable reading time on something he's already read? Which is very reasonable. But my rationale for being a rereader begins with exactly the same thought. I know I'll never be able to read everything I want to read, so why would I even pretend to try? <laughs> as well as reading new books and books that are new to me, I regularly return to books or passages or poems that were favorites in the past. They're a kind of marker or measure. Sometimes I find that I love them as much as I did when I first read them. Other times, I discover that while the words haven't changed, my response to them has. But the rereading I do now isn't quite the same as it was when I was a child, when I would finish the last page and immediately turn back to the beginning and start again right that instant. My childhood rereading caused a bit of a problem at home. At one point, my father noticed that I was checking the same books out of the library again and again and weeks might go by during which I didn't read anything new. He worried about this, and he came up with a solution. Every time we went to the library, I was allowed to choose two or three books that I had already read. Together, we would choose several more that I hadn't read yet. When we got home, I had to surrender the old favorites to my father, who would hide them. After I finished reading all the new books, he would produce the oldies from their hiding place. In this way, I did get to keep rereading those best ever books on my mental list, and that list grew longer and longer, just as my dad had known it would. Well, one of those books, as I said before, was The Man with the Purple Eyes. This is a title that might not be familiar to many of you, so I'm going to take a few minutes to describe the story. As the story begins, Anna and her mother are living in a tiny apartment in the city. They have moved there to be closer to Anna's father, who is in the hospital with some unnamed malady. He is weak and feeble and uninterested in life. Besides being worried about her father, Anna is miserable because she hates the city. Her real home is in the country. She loves to walk the country lanes and wander the fields and hills, and above all, she loves wildflowers which is a passion she shares with her father. In the city, there is hardly anything green, just concrete and steel and noise and sooty grime. Anna goes for a walk one day and pauses in front of a florist's shop. She wishes she could buy some beautiful flowers to take to her father because in a few days it will be his birthday, but all she has is a penny. She can't buy any of the flowers in the florist's window. Suddenly there is a man standing beside her. He is very tall, and she notices that he has purple eyes. They have a conversation about flowers, and Anna tells him that while the florist flowers are very nice, she finds wild flowers much more beautiful. She also tells him that she'd like to buy something for her father, but she only has a penny. The man gives her a round brown seed and tells her that it costs exactly one penny. She looks down at the seed in her hand, and when she looks up again, the man has disappeared. Anna goes back to the apartment and plants the seed in a pot. She keeps it in a cupboard, and for a few days, nothing happens. Then, a little green sprout comes up. It is not very impressive. Anna goes to bed that evening, wishing it would hurry up and grow. The next morning, she opens the cupboard, 
and a cascade of purple flowers spills out. Overnight, the plant has grown and blossomed, and it is now a welter of star-shaped purple blooms that smell heavenly. When Anna's mother takes the plant to the hospital, its beauty and scent rouse the father from his torpor, and he starts to get well almost immediately. In just a few days, he is well enough for them all to return home to the country. They take the plant with him. And this is how the story ends. The first night when they were back in their home, Anna went outside with a sprig of the purple flower in her hand. She dug a hole in the ground and gently placed the vine in it. Then she pressed the earth firmly around it. The flower shone like a lovely star in the evening light. That is the way, child, she thought she heard a voice say. Far down the road, someone was walking away. But he vanished before she could call, and the only sound on the evening wind was the sound of her parents' voices softly rising and falling inside their lighted house. Next morning, when Anna and her mother and father woke up, there was a pale lavender light like a reflection on the walls. Anna ran to the window and looked out. The entire hillside was covered with the purple flower. The white picket fence was hidden by the vine. It ran over, spilled into the roadside, forked up through the meadow, perfumed the whole sunlit morning with its sweetness. But the man with the purple eyes was never seen or heard of again. As I've already mentioned, I read this book countless times when I was young. Now, fast forward 10 or 15 years or so, I'm in college, and everyone who's anyone in the literature department is talking about a book called 100 Years of Solitude by Gabriel Garcia Marquez and its use of a stunning new technique called magical realism. So I read the book, and I love it, and I'm struck particularly by the depiction of a funeral procession during which yellow flowers rain down on the casket until the whole scene is blanketed with blossoms. In my mind's eye, they were almost exactly like the flowers at the end of The Man with the Purple Eyes. Despite my great enjoyment of the Marquez book, I do remember thinking, so what's the big deal with this magical realism? Charlotte Zolotow did it ages ago, <laughs> way back when I was a kid. I didn't realize it at the time, but what the man with the purple eyes taught me was to have the courage to tell the story that needs to be told. Magical realism wasn't in vogue when The Man with the Purple Eyes was written or published. The book is not what you would call a fantasy. It doesn't use the conventions of fantasy. The urban and rural scenes in the story are very realistic. And yet, flowers grow overnight enough to carpet an entire hillside. I learned from Charlotte Zolotow that whatever the story needs, you write it as well as you possibly can, and then let the readers, whether an editor or a reviewer or a child, decide whether it works. If it is truly what the story needs, no matter how strange it may be, and you write it well enough, people will admire it and give it a fancy name like magical realism. I find myself drawing on that lesson often, and believe me, there have been times when I needed it. A few years ago, when people would ask me what I was working on, I would say something like, well, I'm writing a story about 12th century Korean pottery. <laughs> and their eyes would glaze over. <laughs> and they would say something polite like, gosh, that's different. Without the example set by Ms. Zolotow and other writers, I might have taken those glazed expressions to heart and given up on that odd story. Much of Charlotte Zolotow's prose work reads like poetry. She uses rhythm, sound, and repetition not just as tools, but as part of the very texture of the work. Story and language. Charlotte Zolotow's work along with that of other authors I love, has taught me that in the best books, the two are completely intertwined, so much so that we cannot separate the one from the other. When I was writing my novels about traditional Korea, 
I found myself instinctively using a more formal diction, sometimes almost archaic in feeling, to reflect the formal nature of Korean society at the time. I could not have told those stories in a casual cadence. In a way, the story chose the language for me. Where fiction has story and language, poetry has form and language. Many contemporary poets say that they find traditional forms too limiting and have chosen to work in free verse instead. Sometimes I think they overlook the strength of traditional forms, which is to give a big head start to the conversation between reader and writer. The reader has certain expectations of a sonnet or a limerick, and the writer gets to respond to those expectations. Korean literature has a verse form that takes specific advantage of the expectations of readers. It's called sijo. It's spelled S-I-J-O. And similar to haiku for the Japanese, it is sort of Korea's national verse form. Also like haiku, sijo is written in three lines, and its structure is syllabic but the lines are much longer than those of haiku, usually between 13 and 16 syllables. Each line has its own traditional function. The first line introduces the topic. The second develops it further. And the third line must contain a twist, something unexpected, humor, irony, a surprise. I have written a collection of Sijo that will be published as a book for middle grade readers. And I'd like to give you a few examples. This first one is called Breakfast. For this meal, people like what they like the same every morning. Toast and coffee, bagel and juice, cornflakes and milk in a white bowl, or warm, soft, and delicious, a few extra minutes in bed. And here's another one called Summer Storm. <clears throat> Lightning jerks the sky awake to take its photograph, flash. Grumbles of complaint or even crashing tantrums from thunder. He hates having his picture taken, so he always gets there late. <laughs> With Sijo, you have in miniature the delightful paradox of all great literature the reader expecting the unexpected, the reader trusting the writer to tell a story as old as time in a way that will make it seem brand new again. I titled the, this talk, The World as Seen Through Purple Eyes, which is, of course, a tribute to Zolotow's book. But it also means seeing the world in a new and different way, in a way unique to the individual. We all see the world in different ways. No one sees the world in quite the same way you do, or I do, or anyone else. The way we see and respond to the world depends on our individual circumstances, everything from the genes we were born with to the experience we have. As the child of immigrants, I have long been aware <clears throat> that I see the world through eyes that are not purple, but very dark brown and slanted and extremely nearsighted. But that would have not made a really good title, so. <laughs> the way I see the world is indeed influenced by my family background, growing up in the only Korean-American family in the town. The other huge influence on the way I see the world comes from books, especially the books that meant a lot to me as a child. Thinking about both my family's ethnicity and my childhood love of reading enables me to discuss with you a topic for which I have the greatest fondness, food. I am very suspicious of books in which the characters do not eat. <laughs> a picture book maybe, but not a novel. I can't understand it. How can you depict a person's life, whether a day or a month or a year, and they never eat anything? How unrealistic is that? Besides which, food preferences and eating habits are such vivid indicators of personality, such great opportunities to paint character. I was once told by a sociologist that when people immigrate to a new country, there are four things about their native culture that they lose one by one. 
The first to go is the mode of dress. Within one generation, people wear the garments of their new land. Next is the language. The second generation of an immigrant family is usually at least bilingual and often more comfortable in the new tongue than in the old. Third on the list, religion. People do tend to hang on to their religion longer, and if the second generation no longer actively practices the old religion, at the very least, they have generally not adopted a new one. But last of all is food. Food endures longer than any of those other characteristics. The second generation may consume a more eclectic menu, but they still remain fiercely loyal to the food of their parents. I don't wear traditional Korean dress anymore. I speak only a little Korean. I do not practice the religion that my father was raised with, but I still cook Korean food. And a third generation, my own children, have grown up eating it. So you see that food is not something trivial. It's a vibrant part of a culture, reflecting everything from the terrain and the climate to religious observances and history and social hierarchy. My husband is Irish. He was born and raised in Dublin. I lived in Ireland for a year and have visited many times. When I first went there over 20 years ago, I was amazed at how little seafood people ate. It's an island. <laughs> Galway is famous for its oysters, Dublin Bay for its prawns, but none of my husband's family or friends ate them. In fact, all professed intense dislike, even though most of them had never even tried them. <laughs> I found this perplexing until I learned that during the years of the famine, seafood, especially oysters, had been one of the only sources of food for many Irish people. Some had eaten little else for years. When at last the famine ended and they could eat other food, they swore off oysters for life and passed that anathema down through the generations. Food in the present as a connection to the past. Food also provides a tremendous opportunity to discover both our differences and our commonality. I once embarked on an informal study of the stuffed pastry. It seems that nearly every culture produces some form of dough wrapped around filling. Korean mandu, Chinese pot stickers, Mexican enchiladas, Italian ravioli, Russian pierogi, Indian samosas, Moroccan brick. You get the idea. How different they all are, and yet all are beloved among the favorite foods of their corresponding cultures. What is it about these creations? I think it has to do with the idea that they're like little presents wrapped up a surprise inside. And no matter where on the planet we come from, everyone loves that feeling of being given a gift. It is a perfect metaphor, the universal wrapped in the diverse. So it is no coincidence that all of my books have food in them. For me, it was the easiest way into traditional Korean culture, the strongest link between the present and the past. My first book, Seesaw Girl, ends with Jade Blossom carrying a bowl of rice for the evening meal to serve to the men and boys who always ate first. In When My Name Was Kyoko, the mention of rice, or the lack of it, recurs throughout. And in a single shard, the relationships between Tree Ear and Crane Man and Tree Ear and Ajima are cemented by food. Writing about food was part of what made old Korea come alive for me. When you write about food, you have to use all five of your senses, something which is not true of most other experiences. It is a piece of history that may, remains accessible today. When I write in a single shard about Tree Ear's meal of rice with dried fish and kimchi, it is not an intellectual exercise. I have eaten that same meal, the foodstuffs unchanged in a thousand years a visceral connection to Tree Ear and his time. When I began to reflect on this aspect of my books, I realized that I have done the same all my life. One of my first experiences in this vein, and one I'm sure I share with many of you, occurred on reading Laura Ingalls Wilder's Little House books. 
I had to make that maple syrup candy, she wrote about. It was not successful. My mother did not know anything about candy making, and all that happened was that the warm syrup melted the snow in the pan, and I ended up with maple-flavored water. My mother also expressed in no uncertain terms that we would not be building a smokehouse in the backyard <laughs> in which to smoke venison, and what was venison anyway? I think maybe she felt guilty about this refusal because she did her best to accommodate my request during my next phase, which was my all-of-a-kind family phase. I hope some of you are familiar with this wonderful series of books by Sidney Taylor. They are about a Jewish family with five daughters on the Lower East Side of New York before and during World War I. Jewish traditions and holidays are described in bright, warm detail, and I was enchanted by them. My mother helped me make latkes, potato pancakes. She bought Manischewitz gefilte fish, which I ate by the jarful. As a Korean immigrant, completely unacquainted with Jewish culture, my mother was flummoxed by the notion of kosher, but she tolerated most of my experiments with good humor. Until one autumn morning when I came downstairs and announced that I would not be eating breakfast. Lunch or dinner either, I said. Why not, she asked quite reasonably. I sighed dramatically. It's Yom Kippur, I said. I'm fasting for forgiveness of my sins. Apparently, my emulation of the character of Sarah in the Taylor books was pushing things too far for her, so she got on the phone and called her friend Miriam Kaplan, and Mrs. Kaplan told her that children did not normally fast anymore, and if they did, half a day was more than enough. <clears throat> Many of my favorite scenes from books revolve around food, the pleasures of eating alone, Oliver's lunch of tomato and liverwurst sandwiches in Elizabeth Enright's Spiderweb for Two. And who could forget Karana or Sam foraging for themselves in Island of the Blue Dolphins or My Side of the Mountain? Some people dread having to prepare food for themselves and then eating alone. But I love it, my attitude shaped by the scenes in those books. Meals for two, the delightful tea Mr. Tumnus makes for Lucy in C.S. Lewis's The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. Claudia and Jamie eating such interesting meals together during their stay in New York City in From the Mixed Up Files of Mrs. Basilie Frankweiler by E.L. Konigsberg. Baked beans and macaroni and cheese for breakfast. Or how about the midnight snack of jam sandwiches Danny and his father share in Roll Dahl's Danny the Champion of the World. I learned that two people sharing a meal create a most intimate kind of connection. And of course, there are many memorable, memorable scenes of family and group eating in children's literature. These days, thanks to Harry Potter and Hogwarts, a whole generation of young readers is growing up believing that English boarding school food is wonderful. <laughs> And they're right because it's not the food that matters, it's the cam camaraderie that prevails at those meals. The awful meals in literature serve to reinforce the importance of that feeling. The unpleasant dinners that young Laura Ingalls is forced to eat while boarding with the Brewster family in these happy golden years made me cringe to read about. Mrs. Wilder writes that the food was good, but she could hardly swallow in that atmosphere of unhappiness. And so I learned that while good food helps, good company is more important. I love to cook and eat, and I especially love to cook for and eat with friends. My ideas of the communion that results from sharing a meal come not only from my family, but also from reading. Books help deepen the love I have for the feeling of warm companionship that happens around the meal table. So books for young people do have the potential to teach life lessons, but not by didacticism. I know I'm preaching to the choir here, but there are some truths that bear repeating. As a young reader, I was always insulted when I sensed more message than story in a book. It was like what my kids often say to me when I'm lecturing them too enthusiastically. Okay, okay, we get it, Mom. 
Who among us, no matter what age, likes being condescended to? One of the best lessons I ever learned came from Dorothy Canfield's Fisher Understood Betsy. I hope many of you loved this book as much as I did and still do. There is a scene where little Molly falls into a pit and Betsy can't figure out how to get her out. And it's cold and it's getting dark and Betsy wants to run for help, but Molly screams at her not to leave, not to leave her alone there. So Betsy thinks, what would Cousin Anne do? Cousin Anne, so solid and sensible and calm. And Betsy throws a big tree limb down into the pit so Molly can use it to climb out, because that's what Cousin Anne might have done. I can't tell you how often I've used some variant of this kind of thinking. I had a friend in England, a lovely man and a terrific writer named Jeremy. Jeremy was the most gracious person I have ever known. He always seemed to say the right thing at the right time, exactly what you needed to hear but didn't even know it. He came to the first dinner party I ever gave when I was 20-something years old and completely unsure of myself. And when he left that evening, he said, it was wonderful. I especially liked everything. <laughs> Whenever I feel unsure of myself in a group of people, I think, what would Jeremy say here? And while I'm not as clever or as charming as he was, I usually manage to come up with some kind of reasonable response thanks to his inspiration and Betsy's. To those who believe that children's authors should create characters who are role models, I would note the following. Cousin Anne, despite her steady common sense, was not a role model for me. I did not for one instant want to be like her. Nor is Betsy herself a role model in the conventional sense. For although her action has heroic results, it is not what moved me most deeply about that scene. I could not have articulated it back then, but now I know that it was the idea of community that entranced me. In that scene, Betsy calls not upon herself, but on something outside of herself, something she has been given or shown by someone else. She is not alone. She belongs to a community of people who care about her, and she can draw on their strength to supplement her own. What a tremendously reassuring notion for a child. And so it is that the child protagonists in my books all have help from others in resolving their dilemmas. Jade Blossom in Seesaw Girl has the understanding of her mother and the wisdom of her father. The brothers in The Kite Fighters get help from Kite Seller Chung. In A Single Shard, Tree Here has Crane Man and Ajima, and in the end, Emissary Kim and even Old Min himself. How terribly sad it is when a person feels they have no community, no one other than themselves. A heartbreaking tragedy if that person is a child. Where did this consistent motif in my work come from? From my upbringing in a culture that respects elders? Or from the impact of reading books like Understood Betsy? I suspect it's both in equal measure and importance. I know I'm not the only one for whom the memories of childhood reading surface in the world and time. A few months ago, I heard Lois Lowry interviewed on NPR. She talked about losing her sister as a young woman and years later, her son, when he was only 28, and how she was sure that reading The Yearling as a girl had prepared her in some ways to cope with those losses. Catherine Patterson, in her book of essays, The Invisible Child, discusses how her whole way of looking at the world changed on reading Alan Payton's Cry the Beloved Country. Someone sits down and writes a story, puts a part of him or herself into words on paper, and if all the stars align properly, those words get turned into a book. And then someone else reads it, and maybe something in that book becomes part of the reader. A part of the writer has become a part of the reader. If that's not a miracle, I don't know what is. And if that reader is herself a writer, the discoveries form a constant cycle of delight. 
I am always both pleased and humbled to find countless examples in my own work of the influence of the reading I did as a child. The simple, crystalline imagery so important to Asian poetry has great appeal to me. I try to mimic that in my own use of detail and image. The steadfast use of point of view and voice in a book like Roosevelt Grady by Louisa Shutwell. Never once does the story waver from Roosevelt's voice and point of view, all the more admirable because it's written in third person. I can't say that I've ever, ever achieved the same kind of consistency in my own work, but I'll never stop trying. The characterization in What Then Raman by Shirley Aurora, where even the minor characters are beautifully rounded out, especially the elderly, which influenced the portrayals of the elderly characters in my own books. I've noticed that my favorite books from childhood have at least one thing in common. They are almost all, all set in milieu that were exotic to me. As an Asian American child growing up in a Midwestern suburb, that meant books about New York City and the Deep South, and the Western frontier, as well as books set in foreign lands. Of course, there weren't any books at the time at all about Asian American children in the Midwest suburbs, so it could be argued that almost any book was exotic. <laughs> but let's say instead that I was interested in stories where the setting was recognizably different from my home. And this has proved to be a lifelong preference. As an adult reader, I have very little interest in, for example, the so-called women's novel, centering on a middle-class, middle-aged female and her domestic and personal tribulations. They bore me silly, because I live those books every day. <laughs> and I want reading to take me somewhere else. As a child, I had a tremendous hunger for making connections with the unfamiliar. Roosevelt Grady, was the child of black migrant farm workers. His life could hardly have been more different from mine. But when I read that he yearned for a library card, I knew instantly that he was just like me in at least one important way. Many readers and reviewers assumed that I wrote my own books because I knew a lot about Korea and wanted to convey that knowledge to young readers. Nothing could be further from the reality. I wrote about Korea because I knew so little about it. After my children were born, I began reading about Korea so I could tell them something about their ethnic background. I knew a great deal about Korean culture from growing up in my family, but I knew very little about the country itself. The things I learned from my reading were fascinating and sometimes confusing and I began to write about them to clarify my thoughts. For me, it isn't write what you know, but rather write what you want to explore, which seems a natural extension of my reading preferences. And in my rather aimless jottings about Korea, I saw the seeds of what might possibly become a story or two. So I often feel guilty about any credit I am given for educating young readers about Korea because that is not what I set out to do. I wanted to write stories, and I happened to set them in Korea for highly personal reasons. What matters to me no most is not how old Korea is, was different and exotic, but the connections, the similarities between then and there, and here and now, as exemplified in my favorite childhood books. Regardless of the distances in time and space, the connection is made through language words. Language as a raw material is of particular interest to me. Perhaps it's due in part to my upbringing as a monolingual child in a bilingual household. My parents spoke Korean to each other, but never to me and my siblings. Perhaps it's because I discovered in junior high that another language, French in my case, was one of the most rewarding things a person could study. Perhaps it's also my 15 years as a teacher of English as a second language to students from all over the world. Whatever it is, I absolutely adore thinking about and playing with and working on words. I began my writing life as a poet, and I still write poetry when I'm not writing fiction. In about the last five years, I've written approximately 100 poems for adults as opposed to poetry for children. Nineteen of them use language as a topic, fully one-fifth of the total. 
I have poems about the vocabulary of baseball, about the word brother in Korean and English, about looking up a word in the dictionary. I have poems about Chinese ideographs, a child learning to read, and semaphore, the language of flag signaling. I have a poem about doing the Sunday New York Times crossword puzzle. I have a poem about hyphenated words. My obsession with language helps explain why during my teaching career I loved grammar classes when it seemed that every other instructor hated them. Exploration of the importance of language occurs in all my books, but it is most prominent in When My Name Was Kyoko, which is set during World War II and the Japanese occupation of Korea. Because of the imposition of the Japanese language on the Korean population during that time, I was able to confront questions about language directly. The young protagonist, Sun Hee, and her family are required to attend neighborhood accountings where roll call takes place by numbering off. Sun Hee witnesses the beating of an elderly neighbor who does not know how to speak Japanese and therefore calls out her number in Korean. Later, Sun Hee is ordered by her mother to go to old Mrs. An's house and teach her to count in Japanese. <clears throat> when I arrived, this is Sun Hee speaking, when I arrived, she invited me in. I sat on the floor and she served tea. I sipped at mine silently. After a few minutes, she put down her cup and looked at me. You will teach me to count, she said. Yes, Ajima. Good, let us begin. I said the words as I held up the correct number of fingers. This was how the teacher had taught the class when I first started school. Ichi, ni, san, shi, go, I said. I paused there, and Mrs. An echoed the word slowly. Then I went on. Roku, shichi, she shook her head and stopped me. No, she said, to five again. It seemed she'd rather learn the first five very well before going on. Maybe that was a good idea. Ichi, ni, san, shi, go, I said again. We did this a few more times, and then Mrs. An said the numbers by herself. After she had done it three times in a row without a mistake, she sat back. That will do, she said and smiled. You are a good teacher. Tell your mother I said that you needn't come back anymore. I bowed my head, puzzled. I did not want to contradict her, yet I felt I had to say something. But, Ajima, you have only learned to count to five. Surely we should go on to ten. There were ten households in our association. She would need to be able to, account, to count at least that high. No, Mrs. An's voice rang out strongly. I looked at her, surprised. No, she said again. She lowered her voice a little. I will tell you why. I have nothing in this world. You know that. Everyone knows that. No children, no family, alone here all day with nothing but my thoughts. Her voice was still fierce as she continued. They cannot have my thoughts. I will not allow it. She held up her hand. Ichi, ni, san, shi, go, she said, finger by finger. One hand, five fingers of thought. That is all I will give them, not one finger more. Because Korea has been occupied for all her life, Sanhee's lessons in school have always been in Japanese. She can speak Korean, but she cannot read or write it. She starts a diary, which she plans to share someday with her uncle, who has gone underground because of his work for the resistance movement. Um, okay, sorry. She's, she's trying to figure out what it means to be Korean when for her whole life, Korea has been ruled by Japan. Korean was the jokes and stories uncle told us. It was the flag he'd drawn. It was the Rose of Sharon tree Omani had saved, the little circle Taeyul had carved on the bottom of the gourd bowls. Korean was the thoughts of Mrs. An in her own language, not someone else's. My thoughts, too. I was Korean. My thoughts were Korean. I was so impressed by this idea 
that I went at once to the cupboard and fetched a tablet of paper and a pencil. From now on, I would keep a diary. When Uncle came back, he would want to know things. A diary would help me remember. My first entry, paper, fell from the sky today. There was a drop of leaflets by the American Army. I looked at the line on the page and frowned. My handwriting was, as always, quite tidy, but it was in Japanese. I couldn't write in Korean. I'd never been taught how. Could Korean thoughts be written in Japanese? That last sentence is perhaps the single most autobiographical line I have ever written, except for the substitution of Japanese for English and the fact that I sort of turned that line inside out. For me, it's not, can Korean thoughts be written in English, but rather, as a Korean American, what part of me in my thoughts is Korean? If my thoughts are always in English, is any part of me truly Korean? I visited Korea last November, the first time I had been there since I was a child. Like Sun Hee, I do not read or speak Korean, but I do know quite a bit about the language. There are two levels of speech, one used for equals and the other, more formal, used for those who are due respect. This is automatic for Koreans. They never have to think about it. For friends, colleagues, your peer group, you use the more casual form. For your elders, including your parents and all older relatives, teachers, bosses, you use the more formal level of speech. On meeting strangers, if the pecking order is not immediately obvi obvious, it has to be established. Wherever I went in Korea, when I met other writers or people who could be considered my colleagues, I was immediately asked my age. Supplied with this information, the person speaking to me would know which level of speech to use. The editor of the Korean editions of my books is a woman in her late 20s. She kept calling me Miss Park, which I found very formal, and I asked her to call me Linda Sue. She looked horrified and said she could never do that because I was older than her. So we settled on a compromise. She would call me by my entire name. So throughout my stay, she would say things like, would you like a cup of tea, Linda Sue Park? One of the ways to indicate respect in Korean is to add the syllable yo to a sentence. For example, kenchana means something like, no problem, don't worry. If you want to say this with respect, you say kenchana yo. Yo is not really a word, it's a grammatical morpheme. And I can confirm that there is still a great deal more respect shown to older people in Korea than there is here in the US. Not surprising, given that the English language does not have grammatical markers for respect. If we did have this sort of grammar embedded in the language itself, as opposed to less tangible markers like tone of voice and vocabulary selection, wouldn't it be more difficult for the respect itself to become eroded? Because language not only expresses our thoughts, it actually shapes them. I want the language of my stories to do this too, to express the writer's thoughts while at the same time initiating a kind of conversation with the reader. However, when I read, I do not wish to be impressed by the presence of the writer on every page. Look how clever he or she is to write like that. Therefore, when I write, I strive to maintain the paradox of being utterly conscious of every word I use while at the same time making myself invisible. I want to use words in a unique way, but I do not want the reader to notice me, the author. I do not want them to be taken out of the world of the story, even if it's in admiration. I spend a great deal of time trying to achieve that balance, and the phrase I like most to describe what I try to do in my work is unexpected inevitability. On the sentence level, it usually means combining two kinds of ordinary to make something fresh. A very simple example. In Elizabeth Enright's The Four Story Mistake, spring signals its arrival when one of the bushes in front of the house bursts into, quote, a rash of orange rosettes. We know what rosettes are. We know what a rash is. 
Enright puts them together so we know exactly how sudden it was, the transformation from drab green to floral splendor, an image both surprising and logical, which is what makes it memorable. This is one of my favorite parts of writing, and I probably shouldn't confess that I'll often spend hours on a single image, which I consider the most fun I can have, as they say, with my clothes on. <laughs> on the story level, unexpected inevitability is most often applied to the ending. I enjoy this part of writing a lot, too, planting everything within the story so the ending grows out of it with both logic and surprise, trying for inevitability while avoiding predictability. The same old story told in a way that makes it new again. The universal wrapped in the diverse, the long ago and far away traveling via words right to our doorsteps, unexpected inevitability. I hope I have begun to give you some idea of the world that I inhabit when I read and write, a world where paradoxes not only coexist, but thrive. It is a tremendous challenge to live there, but even as I curse and sulk and bang my head on the keyboard, I am enjoying myself immensely. <laughs> I do find it a great privilege to view the world through purple eyes. That is the key then, the real secret to my writing, which is not a secret at all. I love my job, but I could not do it without you, meaning you, the readers, who choose to spend time with books in this increasingly electronic age. You, the teachers and librarians and parents and caring adults who are responsible for introducing my work to so many young readers. You who honor me with this invitation to speak here to let me know that when my work leaves me and goes out into the world, it is finding a home on your shelves and in your hearts. So thank you for all that you do to make my job so rewarding, and I look forward to working with you for many years to come.